Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Bazidlo. I'm principal here at Shrewsbury High School. On behalf of the Shrewsbury High School community and the Shrewsbury Public Schools, I want to welcome you to tonight's forum uh, where we have Dr. Ruth Poti, who's going to speak. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you that don't know, our community has a coalition called the Shrewsbury Coalition for Addiction Prevention Education, also known as SCAPE. We've been meeting for the last three years and tackle a number of substance abuse issues within our community and try and highlight uh, with students and adults in the community some of the issues we're facing. Recently, over the last two years, we've had at least two to three panels uh, regarding opioid crisis within our community. And tonight, it gives me great pleasure to talk, uh, to bring with SCAPE members uh, our guest speaker. Um, a real integral part of our SCAPE Coalition is also a fantastic uh, community member, but also someone who works for us up on Beacon Hill is Representative Hannah Kane. Hannah was instrumental in bringing Dr. Poti here this evening. So I'm gonna ask Hannah to come up and introduce our guest speaker. And without Hannah's help, this would be possible. So big round of applause for Hannah and thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, I know it would, it's really, would be attractive to be home in bed right now on this rainy, disgusting night. So thank you very much for coming out here. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Um, before I introduce Dr. Pody, I do want to bring up um, two folks so that you can put a face to a name. Um, Christine and Jennifer, would you come up? So um, SCAPE is coordinated through Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services. And uh, Christine Mowry has been our project director for our youth mental health first aid for the last couple of years. And she's now our interim executive director. And she's gonna speak in a minute and just talk a little bit about the resource tables that we had outside. And we have our new director of clinical services, uh, Jennifer Trites, and she is uh, two weeks into her role at SYFS. But I figured this was an important opportunity for you all to see these two folks and to know that Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services um, of which the entire board is actually in the audience here tonight. We had our meeting here beforehand so that we could all attend. Um, is an important resource for everyone in this community. So if you need uh, any services for anyone in your family or for your full family regarding counseling or help with any issue, please do not hesitate to contact us at SYFS. But uh, Christine, would you like to speak for a yes, sec on the table? thank you very much, Hannah. Um, First of all, I'd like to thank you for sponsoring this event and for bringing Dr. Pody to us. I'm really excited about my new role at SYFS and my role on SCAPE. Um, we had some really wonderful people here at our resource fair tonight. I'd like to thank the YMCA of Central Massachusetts, the Burroughs Family Branch, Community Health Link Motivating Youth Recovery, the Worcester Division of Public Health, Spectrum Health Systems, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, the Office of the Worcester County District Attorney, Joseph D. Early, Jr. Um, Learn to Cope, Luck, Inc., Next Step Grief, Worcester Chapter, Rockdale Recovery High School, ADHD Essentials, and of course, she's Youth and Family Services. If you missed any information that you'd like to get, please feel free to reach out to us at SYFS, and we'll be happy to connect you with those resources. And enjoy the presentation, thank you. Thank you, Christine, and welcome, Jennifer. Um, and we are also taping this this evening. We have um, folks here from Shrewsbury Media Connection, so that in addition to the people here tonight who are going to be able to hear this, we're going to be able to share it with other community members who weren't able to be here tonight. And I do know this, uh, Dr. Pody was in Westboro last year, and they taped it there as well, and had so many people respond afterwards that they hadn't been able to attend the forum, but went online and watched it and really found it resourceful. So if you have friends who couldn't be here with you tonight, I would definitely encourage you um, to ask them to watch it uh, when it does start to be broadcast on TV. So um, as we continue to fight the opioid epidemic at the local, state, and national level, part of our mission here locally is to make sure that we provide parents, youth, and community members with the information necessary to prevent substance abuse and addiction in our community. And prevention is really best fueled by knowledge and education. I met Dr. Pody in 2016 when I was working to defeat uh, question four, the marijuana legalization question. And I was deeply impressed not only with her amount of knowledge, but her ability to communicate it in a way that was really easy for us to understand. Um, she's a board certified family physician and addiction medicine physician at Valley Medical Group in Greenfield, Massachusetts. She's a native of Western Massachusetts and attended the public schools in the North Quabbin region. 
She attended Wellesley College, Yale University School of Medicine, and did her residency at my alma mater, Boston University, uh, where she remained as an assistant professor of family medicine for eight years. In addition to a full-time practice um, and a full scope of family medicine, she's currently the medical director for the Franklin County House of Corrections, the Franklin Recovery and Treatment Center, and the Pioneer Valley Regional School District, as well as the chair of the Healthcare Solutions of the Opioid Task Force of Franklin County. We're extremely lucky to get you out of Franklin County to be here tonight, so thank you very much. She was named the Franklin County uh, Doctor of the Year by the Massachusetts Medical Society in 2015, and she is chair of the Department of Medicine at the Bay State uh, Franklin Medical Center. Dr. Pody engages many communities in discussions surrounding substance abuse through her many different and wide-ranging series of talks, and I'm thrilled that she could join us here this evening, and I know that you're going to find much information about her presentation tonight that you will find useful in your lives and your families. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Pody. Thank you. I'm using a chest mic. How is that? It seems a little loud, but I've got amazing tech up there. So she, um, Representative Kane didn't tell you the most important thing about me, which is I was born and raised in Worcester County. And every Friday after Thanksgiving, before it was called Black Friday, my parents would pile five of us in our little VW bug, and we would go to Spags. And we did all of our Christmas shopping here. So it was really fun to drive back here again. And my mom would buy those tall um, orange bike flags for each one of the five of us. And we would just bought, which she would let us loose like little chicks. We were pretty little. And we, she would just watch the flags around the store. And I miss bags, right? Those were some awesome days. OK, so we're going to dive right in. We're going to talk about the brain and specifically how the brain is impacted by addictive behaviors or addictive substances. Um, and the brain is. Uh, an extraordinary organ, I think probably the most extraordinary organ in the body. Uh, this is the cover of the National Geographic two months ago in September, and it was entitled The Physiology of Addiction. Does anybody get National Geographic anymore? See, it's always a, just a handful of small hands. I just resubscribe because it's so great, so I'm glad you're getting it. So you can Google this article. It's very good. It's very, the graphics are superb. They have a lot of video associated with it. And um, I mention it because the knowledge set amongst many of us about how the brain breaks with addiction is actually increasingly high. Like more and more people are understanding what happens to the brain with addiction. It's now on the cover of National Geographic. It's on the cover of Time and, and lots of other magazines. We talk about this stuff. And I actually think the generation that we're trying to raise will understand how the brain uh, works with uh, addictive behaviors much better than our generation did. And my hope is that this sort of thing is taught in schools and that kids understand how their brain develops. This, is, this slide deck is available to anybody who wants it. You could take the slide deck. You can claim it as your own. You could give it at Kiwanis next week and at Sunday school on Sunday. I don't care. And the Shrewsbury Coalition will share it with anybody who wants it. Just give them your email. They'll somehow magically make it all work. I'm getting head nods on this one. Um, so the way the brain breaks is very specific. It's also very complicated because I'm talking about the brain here, right? The brain is a complicated organ. The reward circuit of the brain is the part of the brain that addiction impacts. And it's the part of the brain that tells you to survive. It tells you to find food. It tells you to find water. And it tells you to find a mate because your entire purpose being here today on this planet is to survive long enough that you can send your genetic material forward. Most of us didn't wake up this morning and think that way, right? And I know that. But that is the deepest, most elemental part of your brain, which is to survive long enough that you can rear another generation or two ahead of you and keep that generation or two or five alive. This is what we have been doing for the 200,000 years that we have existed in this human form on this planet. And the problem with addiction is it impacts this part of the brain, the part of your brain that tells you to survive. And if you could pick up addiction and move it anywhere else in the brain, if you moved it to the visual cortex and everybody just lost their peripheral vision when they got addicted to alcohol, it would be a really easy problem to treat. I wouldn't let you pitch on a pitcher's mound. You couldn't drive at night, right? All fixed. But instead, the disease impacts the part of the brain that tells you, I should live or die today, which is why it is so hard to treat and why it can be so frustrating to treat and so hard to live with for those of us who struggle with addiction. 
So the chemical that is racing through the reward circuit of the brain is the chemical that you guys all know something about, and that is dopamine. It gives you this great rush of joy and euphoria. It gives you this spike of holy smokes that was awesome, I need to repeat that behavior. That's what dopamine does. It gives you reward for having done something positive, surviving another day, and tells you you need to do it again to survive tomorrow. It has with it associated fine motor skills, which is why when people stop smoking, I can stick a patch on them, I can make them choose nicotine gum. That doesn't always make you stop smoking. Everybody who's tried to stop smoking will tell me that. They miss getting into the car, opening up the cellophane on the package, tapping it down, removing the cigarette, you know, striking the lighter. There's a lot of fine motor memory that is attached to this part of the brain. It's why many of our addiction treatment centers you know, I hate to say it, all my retired people who have a lot of time on their hands should be going to those places and teaching them how to crochet and knit bead because their fingers need to be occupied to quiet down this part of the brain as well. There are two behaviors associated with the reward circuit and dopamine in the brain. And those two behaviors are compulsivity, compulsiveness, and perseveration. I cannot stop thinking about it. My brain is thinking all the time. Now, let's be clear, your ancestors, your great, 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 greats, they were both compulsive and they were perseverators. It is the reason you exist today. Those are awesome behaviors when it comes to survival. It is. You go to bed at night 150 years ago, do you know how hard it was to live in Central Mass 150 years ago? I mean, just pause for a minute on that. You hoped your cow survived the season. You hope you have laid away enough firewood not to be freezing tonight. I mean, think of how you were living. There was no insulation. There was no central heat. I just stopped at a gas station on the way here to get gas. There were 20 billion calories in the checkout, right? And instead, 150 years ago, man, you were, you were fighting for calories. You were skinny, you were hungry, you were hoping you were gonna survive. And I'm not talking 1,000 years ago, I'm talking our recent past. So those brains needed to be compulsive and perseverate in order to think, how am I gonna keep my family alive tomorrow? Am I putting away enough food? Am I gonna go out to the, the salt lick and find the deer track so I can go hunt and kill a deer that can keep my family alive for another week? This is how you had to think. That's, these are very helpful behaviors when it comes to survival. When you take those two behaviors, compulsion and perseveration, and you apply them to addiction, they're not such helpful behaviors. They're really hard behaviors. They're incredibly frustrating behaviors. They're behaviors that the individual sitting in front of you, front of you who have, has relapsed after a good 12 months of sobriety, they are so mad at themselves. They feel like such a piece of dirt. They're so full of shame. And there are days where I walk into a room and I just, I really try never to ever hit my patients. I actually love my patients. But I lay a gentle hand on that cheek and say, man, I want to dope slap you right now. And then I remind myself, compulsive and perseveration. The cycle in the brain is very hard to turn off. So I make an argument when I give this talk that at a baseline, we all have about a, a set amount of dopamine in our brain. And I'm going to make, for simplicity's sake, the argument that everybody in this room has on average about 100 units of dopamine racing around their brain. And we all have behaviors or things that we do that give us a little spike of joy. Honest to God, coming here, driving this drive, and remembering my family shopping at Spags, I had dopamine for a good 30 minutes because I was giggling about that experience and it, it was all positive memory for me. We exercise a lot. That for me gives me tons of dopamine. I also stopped and I got some chocolate and a little Diet Coke to keep me awake. There was a little dopamine release there too. We all do things that give us a spike of dopamine during the day. There are some of us who are happy-go-lucky, golden retrievers, find a solution to every problem people, and maybe our baseline dopamine is 106, right? That's just who we are. You you know who you are, you know your friends who look like that. These two women in the front row are probably just like that. Um, there are many of us who sit with lower dopamine levels at a baseline. It's harder to make us feel good. We have to work a lot harder to feel happy during the day. Our baseline may be sitting at 85 or 90. These are people who come to the doctor a lot. I spend my day with people with low dopamine. That's just because they, they're worried. They're worried about their health. I can't figure out a way to make them um, make a change that's going to make them feel better. So when you think about survival, and at a baseline, all of us are sitting at 100 units of dopamine, and you find and kill a five-point stag, 
you get a spike in dopamine because you know what you just did? You kept your people alive for a whole other week. How awesome is that? Your brain spikes to a dopamine of 150 and then it goes back to normal. The brain says that was great behavior. It's going to help you survive another day. Let's keep that behavior up. When you have sex, it's consensual. Your dopamine spikes to 200 and then it goes back to normal again because that has to do with keeping our race alive, our people alive. When you use a drug like cocaine, your dopamine will spike to 350. And when you use a drug like a strong prescription opiate, heroin, fentanyl, carfentanil, your dopamine will spike between 500 and 900. When you use a drug like crystal methamphetamine, your dopamine will spike to between 12 and 1300. So what's extraordinary is that more of us don't get up every day and take a hit of meth. Right? I just explained something that's six times sex. You would think that more of us would say that seems like a good idea, right? <laughs> so let's talk about it in detail. There are three things that are going to affect the dopamine in your brain. It's an equation. And um, one is how much dopamine gets produced. Two is how many dopamine receptors are re receiving the information on the other side of the synaptic cleft. And the third thing is how many vacuums are sucking dopamine out of the active part of the brain. Those are the three things in the equation. And you're not, you're not aware that you're impacting one of the three things when you, you know, when you go for a three mile run and feel better, but you are. You're impacting something along that equation. Cocaine has the easiest mechanism of action to understand. It does one thing, it turns off the vacuum. Snap, turns off the vacuum, and that's how you get to a 350 of, of dopamine in the brain. I'm not gonna go through every single addictive behavior or, or substance and walk you through it, but I'm doing two of the easy ones to understand. The way that the opiates work is it goes through the opiate receptor called the mu receptor, and, and then it has a negative feedback loop through the GABA system, but at the end of the day, every opiate just makes more dopamine and shovels it out there, okay? So I said there's three things in the equation. I explained two drugs that impact two of the three things, but again, every addictive behavior, every addictive substance at the end of the day impacts dopamine. Sometimes it takes 14 steps to get there. Somebody in the back one day said, tell me about video game addiction. And I was like, I have absolutely zero idea what the video game pathway looks like, you know, way, way, way back. But at the end of the day, it's putting out some dopamine somewhere. We'll figure that one out someday. So the problem is that for the 200,000 years that we have lived in this human form, your brain has gotten really used to having 100, 85, 150, or 200. But when the brain starts to see dopamine levels of 350, 900, 1300, the brain's response to those spikes is, holy smokes, there's something wrong here. This is not okay. This is not in keeping with anything any of my people have ever seen before. I need to down-regulate. I need to turn down the volume. I'm going to stop making dopamine. I'm going to erase 80% of my dopamine receptors, and I'm going to turn on every vacuum in sight. That is the brain's response to these huge levels of dopamine. So people who struggle with addiction wake up in the morning, and their new dopamine level, they're no longer at 100. They haven't seen 100 in a long time. Their new dopamine set point's about 45. It is hard to get out of bed and have a shower and be pleasant to your animal or to your children. It is hard to call my office and not swear at my front office staff. It is hard to do anything that is in keeping with survival. It's hard to act like a normal human being when your dopamine is 45. It's not consistent with survival. And the only way that people know to feel better is to continue the behavior, to continue the substance, right? That's what spikes them back up to an 85 or 100. When you take care of people with addiction, they haven't gotten high in a long time, right? They are desperate every day just to feel normal again, right? Yesterday morning, I took care of a guy who I've taken care of a long time. He's a bad drinker, and he, I love him. He cracks me up. He's, he's just... He's sort of shamefaced, but he also knows that he's doing everything he can to get better. And he used to drink all day, every day. He used to actually drink all night long because his withdrawals during the night were so bad. But he's gotten a little bit better. And in the morning, he wakes up and he has three shots of vodka. And in my head, I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, it's 7 in the morning. How is anybody doing that? But that's what it takes for him to start his day and feel normal. That is just the way it is. And the truth is, He's better this way than he was two years ago, and we've made some improvement. But it's an example of somebody whose dopamine set point
point is miserable and in the toilet, and in order for him to go to work as a construction worker, he has to take his vodka. So this is what people do. And, and you can be angry, you can be disappointed, you can feel sh shame and anger towards them, but at the end of the day, people are desperately trying to feel better. It is why they continue the behavior, and it's what leaves us with this sense of having a broken brain. We could have done this with any other disease state in the body. We could have spent the entire time on the pancreas and the disrupted glucose receptors, which is what causes diabetes, right? We can you know, spend a lot of time talking about every chronic disease in the body. Almost every disease in the body has to do with a disrupted messaging system between chemicals and receptors, exactly what I'm describing with what happens in the reward circuit of the brain. So the reason that I give these talks is the following, because this happened at UMass Memorial guaranteed today. This is a 68-year-old guy in that upper left-hand picture, and he lives in Shrewsbury, and he's having crushing substernal chest pain, and he's grabbing his chest, and his wife is looking at him incredibly concerned, and he's like, no, it's okay, it's just a little indigestion. And she says, I'm calling 911, right? EMS arrives and they look at this guy and think, holy smokes, this guy's about to crump. They give him a sublingual nitroglycerin, they give him a beta blocker, they give him a baby aspirin, they put in a big bore IV and they hang in some morphine and they transmit from his living room right down the street from here his EKG. UMass takes a look at that EKG and says, holy smokes, we're gonna heat up our cath lab. I'm calling in the cardiothoracic surgeon this instant. We may or may not be able to manage him. We may need to med flight him out of here. Cath lab takes a look at him when he arrives and says, this guy's going straight to the operating room. And he ends up with quadruple bypass surgery. Then he's in the cardiac care unit for another five days. And then he's on the telemetry floor for another seven to eight days. And he gets a social work consult because he's gonna get depressed because all men post heart attacks seem to get depressed. He has a new cardiologist. He gets to see me, his primary care doctor, for the first time. He gets 12 weeks of cardiac rehab. How much money would you spend? How much? Hundreds of thousands is the most conservative, fair answer, and I loved how wide-ranging that was. I totally agree. A quarter million dollars, 250000 That's my guess on what we just spent. His next-door neighbor in Shrewsbury is that 24-year-old woman lying on the bathroom floor. She's actually been fighting hard for her sobriety for the last few years, and she's been working uh, in recovery for the last seven months and doing great. And she just got a job last week. She's actually working at Dunkin' Donuts. She's really excited about it. She's been feeling more and more hopeful and more confident. And so when her mom knocks on that bathroom door that morning and finds no response and the bathroom door locked, her mom is a member of Learn to Cope, and she appropriately freaks out. And when she kicks that door down and finds her daughter lying on the ground blue and not breathing, she calls 911 first, and then she administers a dose of naloxone or Narcan. Her daughter doesn't start breathing. 911 arrives, and in a town like this, probably police and fire and ambulance all arrive at the same time. And every patrol car out there has Narcan on board. They use their three vials of Narcan before she wakes up again. They bring her to UMass Memorial ER, and what do we offer her? Right. The answer up front was not much. In the best of circumstances, what do we get her? Yeah, a social worker, a counselor, a recovery coach may have come down and said, hey, are you interested in trying to get better? What can I do to help you get stable? That's the best circumstance, is having somebody come down and talk to her. I want to tell you a little bit more about my 68-year-old guy who I just spent a quarter million dollars on. Both of his parents had cardiovascular disease. His dad actually died at the age of 58 from a massive heart attack. His mom died of a stroke at the age of 72. He smokes a pack of cigarettes a day, and he kicks back a 12-pack of beer every day. He goes to McDonald's four times a week, and I actually don't know him as my primary, his, my primary care patient, because I saw him four years ago. I saw him once. I told him he had high blood pressure, and I needed to have him start taking some medicine. He never picked up the prescription. The pharmacy told me that later. Does this guy struggle with addiction? What's he addicted to? Yeah, nicotine. What else? Alcohol, yeah. And somebody said junk. Yeah, this guy's addicted to fat and sugar, right? He's definitely not addicted probably to exercise or, or you know, he's certainly no vegan. Um, did this guy create his heart attack? Yeah, he did. He's 68 years old with bad genetic history and living not a very healthy lifestyle. Everybody in this room would say this, right? But nobody wagged their finger at him in the, in the living room and said, you know what, you actually created your heart attack, and I think today I'm not going to choose to treat you. I'm not going to choose to treat you because you're an addict, right? You make terrible health decisions. I'm going to deny your medical care, 
right? And in the emergency room, did they do that? And did the cardiovascular surgeon say that to him, right? None of that happened to this man, even though this is a man without any doubt who created his disease. Because who in this room is absolutely perfect, right? Give me your hands. Who are my vegan marathon runners who are like living on their, you know, their smoothies all day or whatever it is? Who is that one person in this room? Every, every time I got one person out there, right? Most of us, we got one person? Okay, great. Most of us make decisions that aren't perfect, right? Most of us have some weight we could lose. Most of, I don't know, how many of you got your 45 minutes of cardiovascular exercise today? Everybody in the room did that? Okay, lucky, good, I love you guys. I love you guys, awesome, right? Thanks, good work. But again, many of us have not done that today, and some of us will never get to it today or this week or this month. None of us are perfect. And what bothers me the most, and the reason I come out on a rainy night with the rest of you on a rainy cold night to do this work is I find this disparity in medical care to be appalling, and I am so tired of it. I can't believe that I went to an incredibly expensive medical school and I learned nothing about addiction. Right? You know how much I know about diabetes? Do you know how much I know about rare diseases I will never, ever see? I learned nothing about alcohol use disorder, which affects 13% of us. I learned nothing about really how to help people quit smoking, which affects 20% of us. I learned none of this, right? I learned it in residency because I went to Boston University and Boston Medical Center, which happens to be a hospital that has specialized in addiction for 150 years. That's what we're good at. Um, so, I am telling you now, if we want to start giving people equal treatment, we should start denying care to all of us who aren't taking good care of ourselves and are making bad decisions every day. And if we want to shame and blame everybody who walks into my office all day, first of all, I'd be the worst primary care doctor on the planet and everybody would fire me, right? And instead, we, start, we need to start taking care of people and taking care of them equally and meeting their needs because people with addiction suffer every day and their families suffer and society suffers and we need to start providing the treatment that they deserve regardless of its cost. Okay, let's go back to the brain. I always think, they probably think I make that dopamine story up but here are my little PET scans that look at dopamine in the brain. So in that middle column is a healthy brain, and orange on the scan is dopamine. So you see pretty healthy brains with lots of dopamine floating around. And that column over to the right are brains of people struggling with addiction. And that top brain is cocaine, and the next brain down is crystal methamphetamine. The third brain down is alcohol, and the final brain is somebody struggling with heroin. I like this slide because it reminds you that I didn't make up the dopamine story, but secondly, I like to look at that alcohol brain because what you see is there's still a surprising amount of dopamine. There's a lot of orange there. The wheels come off the alcohol use bus pretty late in the game. There are a lot of us who are functional alcoholics. We somehow go to work, we get our kids dressed, we somehow maintain our relationships until things really fall apart. You get your second OUI, your partner walks out on you, your kids say they can't stand spending Thanksgiving anymore because they're you're going to be passed out on the couch right after the dinner's over. Uh, the wheels come off that bus late. I really believe that alcohol is one of the worst substances in our society. It happens to be legal. Do I drink? I do drink. I actually am not an alcoholic, and I drink in great moderation. I'm very aware of how I drink. And we're going to spend some time talking about alcohol tonight for sure. Um, there are three things that are going to predispose any one of us to addiction, and this is particularly true of our young people. It's the reason I'm talking to you is because I have in this room teachers and parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles who influence young people. So there's three things that will cause addiction. You don't need all three. You actually probably just need one, but when they all add up together, you're at very high risk. The first is genetics. <coughs> The second is early exposure while the brain is developing. And the third one is a history of childhood trauma. Having poor mental health does not necessarily create addiction, right? You can have anxiety and depression, have a mood disorder like bipolar. It doesn't make you somebody who's going to struggle with addiction. It is the trick case that poor mental health is a subcomponent of these other things. So that when you are 15 years old and you're a guy and you can't fit in and you feel so awkward and uncomfortable in every single social situation, and you find that when you drink, you're the life of the party, right? You find that all of a sudden you're the class clown and you're the guy everybody wants to hang out with. You're a person who has some generalized anxiety disorder at the age of 15 who exposes their brain while it's still developing to alcohol. That's what creates the addiction, right? It's not the generalized anxiety disorder. It's the exposure while developing. So the genetics of addiction are some of the most potent genetics we know ever. 
People walk into my office and they'll say, let me tell you all about my genetic history of cancer. And I'll say, whoa, 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 hold on one second, one second. Can, let me ask you, did that person smoke? And they're like, yeah, they smoked. I'm like, that's what causes cancer. Smoking causes like practically every cancer in, the, in, in your body. So people really fixate, every one of us does, on our genetics with cancer. The truth is most cancers arises from nothing, right? Every now and then you get a BRCA gene or something that really is a setup for ovarian or breast cancer, but many of our cancers arise from nothing. The genetics of addiction are incredibly potent. If you have a parent or a grandparent who struggles with addiction, you have about a 50% chance of developing addiction yourself. So who needs to hear that little piece of data? Yes, your kids actually need to understand what their genetic risk of addiction is. And that may seem to you really unfair because your kids don't get to change that, right? They get what they get, but the reason it is so important for your kids to understand their genetic risk is because they get what they get, they get to influence the next thing 100% of their own accord. And because they influence the next thing, hopefully for the better, they almost get to cancel out all of their genetics entirely. That is why we tell our kids not to say to them, you're hopeless, you will be an addict because everybody in our family is an addict, because you're giving them a piece of information that helps them make better decisions in their future. So when I sat down with my three kids and I said to them, we have a high genetic risk of addiction in our family, you three get what you get, but you get to influence the next thing, you know, my hope is they listen pretty well, and um, you know, my hope is in the next six to eight years they continue to make good choices. Because what we know is that all addiction is a developmental pediatric disease. All addiction starts while the brain is developing. When you talk to somebody who struggles with addiction and you ask the question, how old were you with your first addictive substance? And I always say, was it cigarettes, marijuana, or alcohol? How old were you? What do you guys think the answer is most of the time? Yeah. I got this, like, this is like the A group sitting right in front of me, like, I, holy smokes, they know the answers. I got the nurses right in front of me. I'm loving it. So their answer was 12. So yes, that is the answer. The answer is 12, 13, or 14 is the average age of first start of an addictive substance. And I do this all day. I ask... I mean, in my lifetime, I've asked tens of thousands of people this exact question. How old were you with your first addictive substance? When I've asked this question in the jail, so I'm a doctor at a local jail, and, and I've asked it in a room full of 150 inmates, who was 12 years old with their first substance? Every hand is in the air at 12. But then when I start counting back, 11, 10, 9, I have hands in the air at the age of 6. So that's a first grader, right? People who are incarcerated are some of the sickest people in our society. You know, jails are today's mental health institutions. When we started closing down mental health institutions, people with severe mental health disorder had nowhere to go. And where are they now largely getting no treatment? They're locked up. It's not a good thing for them. I don't actually think it's a good thing for society, but to have a six-year-old, right? And no, I mean, I feel sick when I see that. I feel sick when a patient tells me that, because I'm always like, how could that have happened? How can you be a first grader and be drinking alcohol or smoking a cigarette? How do you even know to light a match, right? But when you ask the question, like, how did that happen to you? I try to stay calm. How did that happen to you? How did you get exposed to marijuana at that age? They'll say, you know, my uncle thought it would be funny to get high with me. My uncle gave me the pot, right? And we would, get, we would do a bowl together starting at the age of nine. My dad was dropout drunk every night in his armchair with a, hand, a half handle of vodka. And I was six. I was curious. I was wondering what was so interesting in that bottle. And if it was so good for him, why wouldn't it have been good for me, right? This is how our kids get it. They get it from us, the adults in the room. So, if you are 15 years old and you start drinking, and drinking here is defined as two drinks a week, right? Not a half kegger, two alcoholic beverages a week. 40% of those 15-year-olds will become alcoholics. If you wait until the age of 21 to start your drinking, 7% become alcoholics. This is the reason we tell our kids about what their genetic risk is. Because if you can delay your use of an addictive substance till after the age of 23 or 24, you will not develop the addiction. You will have bypassed it. When you do studies looking at families with addiction and lay them on top of families without addiction, by the time you get to brain fully developed, you've almost entirely canceled out the genetics. Not 100%, but it goes down to like 5%, which is extraordinary, right? 
This is the thing our kids get to control, and that's why they deserve to know this data. So if you haven't talked to your kids, I'm gonna encourage you to talk to your kids about this. Okay, so let's talk about our kids, because the truth is, this generation is making the best decisions about substances that any generation has in 40 years. And I'm gonna say that almost across the board. That we're gonna spend a lot of time on marijuana tonight, because that's where my anxiety is highest these days. But I am gonna tell you that generationally, our kids are making really good decisions. So who are my high school students in the room? I have a handful. You're not in high school, yeah. You look great, but you're not in high school. Yeah, you, I got, you guys are high school, awesome. So I need you to look around at your high school kids and pat them on the back, because the truth is they're making great decisions. And I'll be honest, those of us that went to high school in the 80s and 90s, we made some terrible decisions, and I'm right up there, right? You remember those bad old days? Okay, so we've never seen cigarette smoking be lower, ever. So can I just, now that you guys have raised your hands, what do you guys think about cigarettes? Any opinion? Yeah, that's the answer. He said they're gross. You ask anybody between the ages of, I don't know, under the age of 20, what do you think about cigarettes? The average answer is they're gross. They're disgusting. They're gonna, I've had kids say to me, they make my skin wrinkly and cause bladder cancer. And I'm thinking to myself, that is really advanced thinking. And yes, that is true, right? Our generation of young people are unlikely to ever take up cigarette smoking. It's not zero, it's like six or seven percent of high school seniors, but the numbers have plummeted. And that's because the sense of harm with cigarettes, with nicotine, is really high. They know it's really bad for them. That is a good public health intervention that has happened in the last 50 years of time. The problem is that the sense of harm with marijuana has gone way down. Consequently, use has gone up. Because if you ask the average 20-something and under what they think of marijuana, what do you get back as a response? It's no big deal. What else? It's not addictive. It's not, it's not going to be addictive. What else? It's legal and it won't kill you. Now, it's legal is the first true thing that's been said because it is legal, right? As of November of 2016, and granted not everything's rolled out yet, it is legal in the state of Massachusetts. What else? It's natural, it's organic, it grows in the ground, it's better than those terrible pharmaceuticals. Well, it helps me, it's medical, it cured my dad of cancer. I had a high school kid in, in the back of a room say that, I'm thinking to myself, it did not cure your dad of cancer. It may have helped him with some cancer-related chemo symptoms, but it did not cure your father of cancer. It helps me sleep, it helps my anxiety. I have kids tell me it helps them with their school grades, it helps them with their athletic performance. And I'm thinking to myself, seriously, there is no sport where having slowed reflex is a benefit, zero. <laughs> So let's talk specifically about what happens to the brain during adolescence. There are three things that happen every single day in this high school and in the Shrewsbury Middle School that are absolutely critical, some of which the only time they happen is during this phase between the ages of 12 and 24. And the first one is something called synaptic refinement. You have tens of billions of connections in your brain firing back and forth from the age of pre in utero to age 12. And that tangled mess is one hot mess of a brain. The teenage years, what happens during this time is you prune back. You get rid of these synapses that you no longer need and you figure out which ones you need to hold on to. This is a critical thing that happens. It is the only time that happens in your life. There are times during adolescence where you are losing 30,000 synapses a second. What do you want your kid to be doing where they're actively used losing 30,000 synapses a second? You want this prune back to happen. It has to happen. In fact, it not happening leaves you a very messy, confused, oftentimes very mentally ill brain. So this is a positive thing that happens, this synaptic refinement. But man, you want your kid on an athletic field. You want them reading a book. You want them meditating and doing some yoga and, and petting their dog's belly, laughing with friends. You want them doing positive things while this stuff is happening. The second thing that happens during this phase is something called myelination, or in sheathing or insulating fast pathways in the brain. You get rid of the dusty roads and you make these highways, these highways that you want to stay put for a long time. So these brains of our teenagers are absolutely spectacular. And I am the parent of three teenagers, and man, they make me nuts sometimes. But I remind myself that their brains are doing exactly what they need to be doing. These are brains that have 
a lot of act first and think later, less consideration for negative consequences, much more risky, impulsive behavior. These are brains that are trying to figure out the walls, the ceilings. They are trying to push the envelope all the time because they need to sort out what needs to be kept and what needs to be gone. That is a perfect brain. And again, we want to have so many wonderful opportunities for our kids so that they can push the limits um, safely and in ways that are really going to leave them with a healthy brain at the end. There's never a time in your life where emotions are felt this widely. The spectrum of emotions is huge. And there's never a time in your life where you're more influenced by your peers, ever, ever. And I want you to pause on that with me. When you were in second grade and seven years old and one of your friends said, let's go do the stupid thing on the playground, you were like, no, I think it's a bad idea. I'm going to go tell the teacher, right? And when you were 27 and your buddy said, let's go do the stupid thing, you were like, dude, you're an idiot. I'm not going to go do that. But when you're 15 and 17 and one of your friends says, let's go do this, you're like, yeah, I'm in, right? I'm in. <laughs> Because in terms of brain development, when you think about adolescence, you have been forced out of your family cave a while ago, right? By the time you hit adolescent, male or female, you were gone. You were competition, and you were also another mouth that I couldn't really afford to feed. So you really were on your own pretty fast, and you think adolescence isn't about finding your herd. It is about finding your herd desperately. That's one of the reasons why adolescence is so challenging, is because so much of the time you're like, I don't have a herd. She doesn't like me. Where am I in the, in the mix-up of things? I mean, who in this room would relive high school? Go back and relive it all over again. There's always one person, but I tell you, it would never be me. I would relive a lot of my 20s. They were, that was an awesome decade. I would never go back to Maher Regional High School in Orange and relive those days. They were really painful for me, and I think they were challenging for a lot of us. Okay, so I said there were three things that happened during this adolescent phase. The first two, myelination and synaptic refinement. The third one is you lay down synapses in the brain. You lay down the receptors. The major one you lay down is dopamine. Dopamine gets laid down in the outer cortex of the brain. You guys know exactly what happens to dop dopamine when exposed to addictive substances. The lay down of dopamine is the reason why all addiction is a developmental pediatric disease. It is while the brain is developing that that gets impacted. But there's another receptor out there called anandamide. We don't quite understand all that anandamide does, but we think it's part of the chemical structure that determines what gets cut away. And the problem with anandamide there's nothing really wrong with it. It's actually quite lovely. But it is a naturally occurring endocannabinoid that happens to be the mirror image of THC, which is the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. And your brain is unable to differentiate THC from the naturally occurring endocannabinoid. This is a massive problem. Because when your brain is trying to figure out what it wants to hold on to and what it wants to get rid of, and it can't differentiate THC from the naturally occurring thing, THC is much more potent than your naturally occurring one. So it's like using a sledgehammer to determine what gets kept and what gets thrown away, instead, having, instead of having a nice, perfect scalpel making this decision. I'm going to say this sentence aloud, or maybe three sentences, because I actually I feel pretty strongly about it. What you do with marijuana over the age of 25 in the safety of your own home, not on anybody's public roads, not operating on my knee, not taking care of my children or changing the lug nuts on my tires, I don't really care. I don't think marijuana in the fully grown adult brain in the privacy of your own home is any worse than alcohol. Am I happy about the ballot measure that got passed last November? I'm not. I think it was a really bad decision for public health in the state. But the problem is we can't reverse it. This is my biggest worry about marijuana. It is a neurotoxic drug to the developing brain. That's what it is. And when you start legalizing a drug like marijuana, it is available everywhere. And it will be all throughout our lovely, beautiful high school on a hill here in Shrewsbury. I know that for a fact because we've watched that roll out in the other states. I know that for a fact because I have a medical marijuana dispensary in Northampton that I use actually for my patients who are really sick. And you know where we see medical marijuana products? We see them in Northampton High School and other local high schools. You have to be 21 years old with a special little certificate to walk into that place. I know those high school students aren't walking into that, but those products get sold and they get distributed throughout the high school. This is a drug that interrupts 
interrupts brain development. So when you're using marijuana as an adolescent, it has an impact on attention, verbal learning, memory, and processing speed, and that stays even when you're not high. When you look at the data that comes out of New Zealand, this is, I'm gonna compare the two extremes just to make, it, make the juxtaposition really clear. I'm gonna compare people who used marijuana zero times between the ages of 15 and 21. That's my top light gray bar on those three different graphs. And I'm gonna compare it to the category of people who used marijuana 400 times or more between the ages of 15 and 21. Now I wanna pause and say 400 times in a six year span of time is not a lot. That is like a couple times a week use, right? Or daily use or every other day use, right? It doesn't take much to get to 400 uses of marijuana in six years. Let's look at the uh, graduating from college rates. People who use zero times were graduating from college 36% of the time by age 25. 400 times or more, the rates were 2%. Unemployment rates, 21% by age 25, unemployed with the zero use, compared to 52% of the people using it 400 times or more. And then when you look at um, dependent on state for support, 25% by age 25 of the zero use compared to 57%. This for me is failure to launch. I love my three kids. I want them to grow up and leave my house, right? Because that's what I think I should be doing as a good parent, is to launch my kids out the door, to become whatever they're gonna be and be tax-paying citizens and take care of other people, right? I don't want them living with me when they're 32, right? Unless they have major mental illness or physically ill, in which case, of course, I will support them. I don't want them living in my house because they were exposed to a substance that disrupted their brain development. Um, so the studies also, both New Zealand and um, Australian studies, eight point drop in IQ by age 35. The problem with everything I'm showing you is it's based on the old marijuana. These are studies that looked at people using marijuana in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And by the time we get to the late 90s, when prior to that, every marijuana plant out there had THC levels of about 3% or less, Today's field-grown marijuana, grown in my backyards of Northfield, Massachusetts, have THC levels now sitting between 9% and 16%. The product is more potent in the field. And then the next thing is that this is what marijuana looks like to our kids. These are the THC concentrates. So these have between 70 and 90% THC. If you found this in your kids' room in their dresser, I mean, most of us wouldn't be able to know what it is, right? We would pick it up with a Kleenex and be like, ugh, what is this? But I'm telling you, these are incredibly potent drugs. Our kids know what they are and they know how to use them. So I am showing you data that shows a disruption to the developing human brain at very low levels of THC. And then I'm explaining to you that really what is out there is this incredibly potent product. You guys know there's a lot of ways you can get marijuana into your system. You can smoke it, you can vape it, you can eat it in milk and beer and spaghetti sauce, you can rub it on your body as a cream, you could put a tincture under your tongue. There are so many ways to use this stuff. The problem is the industry is intending to market this stuff to as many young people as possible. So this is Colorado pot stores. This is lookalike candy and cookies and cotton candy, um, anything you can imagine. And if you think my 72-year-old patient with pancreatic cancer is eating gummy bears to help her with her vomiting from her chemo, She's not eating gummy bears, right? This is an intentional industry whose job it is to addict as many people as possible. Because when your business is to sell an addictive substance, you actually have to sell addiction, right? We know that. You think the alcohol industry has your best health at stake? You think they're looking out for your liver? Their job is to sell their product, right? And that's what marijuana is doing too. And part of the business model of marijuana is to addict as many people under the age of 25 as possible because that's how you survive and make billions of dollars in that industry. That is a fact. You, you know, there may be people here who are very pro-marijuana. That is fine with me. But again, I think everybody in this room, when they leave here, should at least acknowledge that its presence in the developing brain is damaging and a huge concern to many of us in public health. So this is the New England Journal article that I both read and refer to all the time. Because what this article does is it talks about what we looked like as a tobacco, largely free society 118 years ago. In the year 1900, 
Tobacco existed in North America. It's a Native American plant. It was used by the Native people of our land for rituals and infrequently. They were not smoking the equivalent of two packs a day. You know, my Mohawk people were not smoking two packs a day. The industry took over tobacco in about in the year 1900, and the first thing they did is they grew a more potent tobacco plant. They drew a plant with bigger leaves, with thicker veins, because that's where the nicotine is. So that's the first thing that happened. I just said that's what we've done with marijuana already. We're growing a more potent product in our backyards. Then the second thing they did is they packaged it in a way that made it easier to use with more addictive substances in it. They added another 350 chemicals, they wrapped it in a small piece of paper and packed 20 of them in a carton and sold it to you for 10 bucks a, ba a box. And that is how by the year, in 1900, less than 1% 1 of Americans smoked cigarettes and by the year 1950, 70% of American men were smoking, 70%. That's where we were, right? And we know this stuff. We have learned these lessons. And do you think that we would apply some of the lessons we already knew to marijuana and somehow we didn't? The great voters, not all of us, but a majority of voters in Massachusetts basically approved a ballot measure that was written by the industry that has no limits anywhere. Basically, until the Cannabinoid Commission comes out with some of the regulation, this stuff is gonna come somewhere near you. And my hope is, I can't remember what Shrewsbury's decided, is this a, ta a town that? No, strongly no. Strongly no, but you guys have a moratorium? on. on right now. So your great representative said that the town of Shrewsbury actually voted against marijuana, right? Which is good because, again, the majority, good for you guys. And that for the towns in Massachusetts that voted against it, it can be a decision made by elected officials in the town, a select board. You guys have a select board? A, 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 a town meeting that makes the decision that you may not, you could choose not to have a recreational marijuana store. I can guarantee you, most of you as parents don't want a recreational marijuana store coming onto one of your blocks anytime soon. So the further you have to travel to get the stuff, likely the better it is. Um, right now, and I'm actually gonna look over towards Jody, how many towns have done this right now? 107 of Massachusetts town, and what do we have, 270? 251 towns, so not quite half. 350, ooh, that's a big number of towns. We have a lot of work to do, but so about a little less than one third of towns in Massachusetts have at least put a temporary moratorium on recreational stores. But there's plenty of towns that haven't yet voted, and it sounds like your town is working really hard to be one that doesn't allow this stuff in. It's not going to be positive for people. Okay, I know I spent a long time on marijuana, and I'm sorry I had to do that to you guys, but I tell you, if everybody in this room and everybody in the state had at least that much knowledge back in November, this wouldn't have passed. That's what I think. And instead, we just went against an industry that had billions of dollars to campaign against us, and they won. And probably they're going to win in other states as well. We're going to talk about alcohol now. So one-third of us in this country drink absolutely zero. And one third of us in this country drink very little amounts of alcohol. A drink a week, a couple drinks a month, very light social drinkers. And the final one third of us in this country drink all the rest of the alcohol sold. <laughs> and the final 10% of us drink on average nine to 10 drinks every single day. Now some of those people aren't here tonight because to get nine or 10 drinks in, they needed to have started a little while ago as far as I'm concerned. Um, but that's a lot of alcohol. By most people's measures, nine to 10 alcoholic beverages a day seems like a lot. But I'm gonna make an argument, it actually doesn't take that much to get there. So when you ask yourself what is a drink, an average 12 ounce old fashioned beer is a drink. Now when I drink, I drink a hoppy. You know what my favorite beer is? It comes out of Worcester, right? Anybody know the, the bee hoppy? I'm a bee hoppy girl, right? That's a great beer. You know what the percent alcohol is in that thing? I don't know, it's like 8.6%, it's really high, and it happens to be a really big can of beer. That can of beer is equal to two beverages, okay? And for those of us who aren't drinking Bud Light, many of your beers are 16 ounces, and they're, they're you know, between six and 8% alcohol. You gotta do the math and acknowledge what you're drinking, okay? This is, so that's a beer, it's 12 ounces, 5% alcohol or less. That's what counts as one drink. When we look at hard alcohol, it's 1.5 ounces of hard liquor. 
When you make your average mixed drink, you're actually pouring in multiple different ounces of different things to make a drink. So a cocktail can easily be equivalent to one or two drinks or three once you do the math on it. So this is the real problem is that every day I spend my day asking patients lots of personal questions. And every day I ask my patients, tell me about your relationship to alcohol. And many of my women will say, you know, I have a couple drinks at night. And I'm like, mm -hmm, what are you drinking? And they're like, oh, I drink wine. And I'm, mm -hmm, how much wine are you pouring? And they're like, you know, I have a glass of wine at night. <laughs> so this is what we know about the alcohol industry, is that they are desperately trying to build their market. And in the last 15 years, we have never seen a shift like we have seen of women becoming big drinkers, and in fact, women becoming alcoholics. This stuff is sold as mommy juice and mommy timeout. And you know what? I get it. I am a working mom. I know what it's like to get up at five and walk the dog and tackle last night's dishes and you know, scramble around my house to get ready for work and get the kids out the door and then go work eight or 12 or 15 or 16 hours. And then you know what I'm gonna come home to? A house that's still a mess and the dog hasn't been walked and I'm gonna be up till midnight and I still will not have gotten my exercise in tonight, right? So a lot of us in this room, and I'm gonna to talk to the women, a lot of us have lives like that. And it's become very normal to walk into the house after a terrible day at work and glug, glug, glug some wine. It is very normal, in fact, actually the only normal thing to go out with your girlfriends and drink, right? How many of you are going out with your girlfriends and going out for a big hike? Lots of us are drinking and a lot of it is wine. This is a shift demographically that is not a positive shift, right? We may say it's all good, my doctor says I should be drinking, I'm telling you, I'm a doctor, right? And y'all shouldn't be drinking like that. When they do the studies on alcohol being maybe beneficial for health, first of all, who do you think funded most of those studies? right? The alcohol industry. The second thing is maybe an ounce of, of liquor um, every day or every few days may be beneficial, but there's nobody in this room is drinking an ounce of anything. And instead, what we do as adults is we actually role model really bad behavior. We come home after a terrible day at work, and the first thing our kids see us do is pop off the top of the beer bottle or open up the bottle of wine and start glug glugging. That's what your kids see, right? When you walk in the house after a terrible day at work, and you look at your kids and say, man, I've had a terrible day. I'm gonna go on a walk with the dog. Does anybody wanna come with me? I have Worcester's own John Kabat-Zinn sitting there on my phone and I'm gonna go push my smartphone app and I'm gonna go do a 10 minute meditation in the living room. Anybody else need to do a 10 minute John Kabat-Zinn app with me right now, do a little mindfulness-based stress reduction? That's the stuff you should be remodeling for your kids, right? Because what your kids learn when they watch you walk in the door every single night is they learn when you're miserable, when you're stressed out, that alcohol is going to help you. That's the message they get from you. When you have every adult party you have ever hosted at your house or every adult party you've ever gone really have a very strong focus on alcohol, you think they don't want in on that game? It's really important that we shift the modeling that we do as adults because your kids are watching everything you do. I came home uh, about six years ago from the hardware store with a lock. And I got out my drill, and I measured out the things, and I installed that lock, and I locked up all the alcohol in the house. And my kids were like, Mom, what's up? Like, do you not trust us? And I'm like, no, I don't trust you at all, right? I love you. I think you're pretty damn awesome some days. But you're a teenager. And why would I have my alcohol sitting in a cabinet readily available for you to drink when what I've already told you is your genetic risk is already bad? Why am I going to make this any easier for you to have access to, right? Um, and that's just the way it is in our house, right? We talked about it. It wasn't to punish them. I'm just not going to make it any easier for them. My husband and I are always like, it's not even worth having a drink because neither of us can ever remember the combination on the lock anymore. <laughs> Okay, it was a long time ago, but a while ago I said there are three things that are gonna predispose you to addiction. The first one is genetics, and the second one is early exposure while your brain is developing. And the third one is a history of childhood um, um, trauma. This is a study called the ACE study. So I have, my, I have a lineup of nurses right in front of me, but do I have other medical people in the room, guidance counselors, social workers, therapists? Can you guys just put your hands up? So I've got a lot of people, that makes me happy, I love that. Um, so in this room, who knows what the ACE score is? Okay, that's good. So I actually have a lot of the same hands going up, which makes me happy, but it's always surprising, but not surprising, that most people have no idea what I'm about to talk about. The Adverse Childhood Experience Study came out in the year 1996, and it was a study done by, um, uh, 
I always forget his name, but uh, Fellini, Vincent Fellini, out of Kaiser, San Diego. So a middle class, largely white group population where they asked 17,000 adults what happened to them under the age of 18 in their houses. They went at it for one specific reason. I'm, I'm not going to tell you what the reason was, but they ended up finding the stuff that they did not anticipate at all. And I want you to understand what this study asked and what it ended up um, being able to tell us. So in this study, 10 questions under the age of 18. You do not give this survey to a child, or it's not intended for a child. But you, while you're sitting here with me, should figure out what your ACE score is. For me, this is a vital sign. When I look at my patients, and I've gotten their respiratory rate, and their oxygen level, and their blood pressure, in my own head, and often in their own head, I am trying to sort out who I'm dealing with in front of me, and what their childhood history of trauma is, because it impacts so many of their other diseases. So I'm going to really say these things very fast um, so you understand what this is asking. Did a parent or another adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be hurt? Did a parent or another adult push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, or ever hit you so hard that you had marks or you were injured? Were you ever sexually abused? Did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, or that your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, support each other? Did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, and had no one to protect you, or that your parents were too drunk or too high to take you to the doctor if you were sick? Was there somebody in your house who was incarcerated? Did you grow up in a household with somebody with a major um, substance abuse problem? Did you watch your father physically abuse your mom or your stepmom? Were your parents separated or divorced? Ten questions. I probably missed one or two. And this is what's known as the ACE study, or the ACE score. And what was not predicted by this until they then overlaid the answers to these people on top of 50,000 other Kaiser patients is that if you score a six or a higher on the ACE study, you're going to die 20 years early. If you score a four or higher on the ACE study, you're at six times the rate of a heart attack. You're much more likely to have asthma, emphysema, multiple uh, broken bones, 30 or more sexual partners. This is one of the best predictors of who is going to struggle with addiction. So it's a measure of abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. This impacts how our kids learn. It impacts every kid that, start, that struggles with a traumatic childhood in this school. Kids with high A scores do not graduate from school. They are suspended all the time. They have impulsive behavior. They act out. They tend to have a lot of angry outbursts. They tend to be very distractible. What does that sound like? It sounds just like ADD. And in fact, oftentimes, I think we're misdiagnosing kids with ADD when they actually have childhood trauma that's not being addressed. So schools in Massachusetts are actually getting much better at this. There's a, there's a statewide curriculum that looks, like, looks at trauma and how to get better treatment in our schools. But you know, the average doctor's office, I was giving this talk in, in a similar form to a group of pediatricians on the North Shore two weeks ago. And that's a group that actually should know the ACE score. Pediatricians, this is, talk about a vital sign, right? You should know what's going on with your kids. And most of the ACE stuff came out of the pediatric world. But in a room where I had probably 140 pediatric people, only one person in the room had heard about the ACE study. This is in Massachusetts, right? Like, they should know. Um, so what I will say to you is what your ACE score is matters. You don't get to change it, of course, but you could actually, you know, learn some techniques to manage it, right? And what we know about trauma is it doesn't respond to talk therapy on the couch. It doesn't really respond to medicine. It responds to different kinds of treatment. And one of the things that your task force can get good at is figuring out who in our community knows something about trauma and how to treat it. Because the trauma looks different. And so in Franklin County, five years ago, I had nobody that was doing trauma treatment. But in the last five years, most everybody's gotten good at it. Everybody's gone off and done their CME education, and they're doing EFT and EMDR and all these other initials that actually have meaning for people who struggle. So it's a good thing to figure out who out there knows something and start building your capacity. Because this is an underdiagnosed diagnosed problem that has a major impact on public health forever. OK, three things that are going to predispose any one of us. Gen genetics, the early exposure, and a history of trauma. And the message that is my take home to you guys is to talk to your kids a lot. You should be talking to your fifth graders, fifth graders. Because if the average age of first start is 12, 13, or 14, fifth grade, 
right? That's when you start your conversation and you continue it. Your kindergartner should know if you find a pill on the ground, you get an adult. No kindergartner should be picking up a pill because lisinopril, five milligrams, will kill a child, right? So these are like little lessons that our kids should know. My kids know the rules at our house. You don't get to take any pills. You don't get to take any over-the-counter Advil or Benadryl unless you talk to an adult. That is not because I am a doctor or that my husband is a doctor. That is because I'm a mom, right? And I know my kids don't know the difference between Tylenol and Ibuprofen. And in fact, most adults in this room don't know the difference either, right? Because it's darn confusing. So uh, I don't lock up all those medicines. I actually have thought about it. But in general, if I ever find a bottle of anything in my kid's room, they know I completely flip, freak out and they have to ask me. I have a headache. Well, what else have you tried for your headache? Have you eaten? Have you gotten any exercise? Let's put a cold pack on your neck. And yeah, take 400 milligrams of ibuprofen. Okay, so again, our kids are making awesome decisions. These are the rates of use of alcohol, cigarettes, and other illicit drugs, which includes marijuana, which is actually fairly flat. But you look, in the last, since 1995, the numbers have come down. An exception when it comes to nicotine is the vaped products, the e-cigarettes. So I have school officials in the room, and it's not me throwing this high school under the bus, but you guys must find vape pens and e-cigarettes here. Are you guys school nurses? Oh, man, awesome. Okay, the school nurses know everything. That's right. So this, the smart row up front, um, they know about finding vape pens in the school, right? And um, I'm not pointing any fingers at the school. You know who has a lot of vape use? The western suburbs. Metro West, those really rich towns, their vape use is through the roof. Because these things are not cheap. They're expensive. Yesterday's New York uh, Boston Globe, did anybody read a great article on vaping in high school in the Boston Globe yesterday? It's worth Googling when you get home. I read it last night at midnight. But it's a really great article that talks about the level of vaping that's happening in our public schools and in our private schools and what's being vaped. Because the stuff that's out there is not just the flavors. It has a lot of nicotine in it, right? Here I am saying our nicotine rates will be the lowest ever in generations. And then lo and behold, I got kids using nicotine without anybody knowing because it is odorless and it makes no sound and it makes no smoke and there's no, you know how it used to be in the 1980s? You'd walk by the bathroom and it would stink and you'd be like somebody smoking in the bathroom. Those days are over. The other thing that is getting vaped in the schools is hemp oil and cannabinoid oil and things that are really marijuana. That is a problem. So it's much sneakier how it is that our kids are accessing this stuff. Um, I have one slide on this subject, and, and I could probably develop an hour-long talk on this, but I have to say that parenting the I generation, the first generation that has a glowing device glued to their palm, is one of the hardest parts of parenting, right? Definitely worse than potty training, and I hated potty training. <laughs> Who in this room has struggled with their kids about their devices? Right. Don't you love it? Isn't it really fun, that shouting match you have at your house, right? Like trying to limit. I mean, how much time are your kids supposed to be on devices? Like two hours or less, right? I mean, part of it is our schools. Our schools mandate very appropriately that our kids use technology. They are using computers and pads, and, and they're communicating some homework stuff on their devices. But I know what my kids are doing on their devices. They're watching YouTube videos, and they're Snapchatting, and they're posting things on Instagram. They're doing stuff I know nothing about and do not understand. And that happens every single day. And what I wish is I could walk into my house, and I could flip a switch, and every device goes off, right? That's what I want. To have happen. I want every device every day to explode electronically, but work again tomorrow after two hours. I want them off, right? So this is a great article that I read in August. This came out actually in September of 2007. And again, you guys are going to take my slide deck because anybody who wants it is going to sign up somewhere on the back. Okay. Um, and anybody can have this, but this is an amazing article in the Atlantic Monthly about what this I generation is, ha is happening to them. It's not positive, guys. Much higher rates of depression, anxiety, really hard time connecting to real human beings. Because you don't spend a lot of time talking to real human beings when you're tapping away on your phone, right? This is a problem that this generation is having, and it's a problem that we're having as adults, right? Our kids are smarter than we are about technology. How often have you turned to your kid for help? I do it all the time. I'm like, I can't make this work. Make it work for me. I do it all the time. Um, and you know what? The internet, amazing, lovely. You are, all of us were on the internet 1,000 times today. But you know what you can see on the internet? Horrible stuff. Horrible stuff that nobody under the, any, none of us should be even seeing, but our kids are seeing it. 
So Comcast, I'm not promoting Comcast, but I think they happen to be one of my carriers. They have a, a, an app that actually does shut down your kid's phone. I haven't figured it out yet, quite honestly. I need, my, I need my big kid to come home and show me how to use it. But there is an app that some of our carriers are promoting to say you could turn off the phones after a certain number of minutes during the day. We're, I mean, we should have figured that out a while ago. This stuff is not that hard, but most of us feel like we don't have control. Am I alone in that? What is it called? The circle by Disney. Is that something that shuts things off? The circle by Disney. Is it easy to understand? OK, OK. It, there's no commercial promotion here, but there's something called the circle by Disney that may power down. Your kids will not speak to you, and that's OK. It's OK, because you're doing the right thing. You're being the parent. OK. Everybody comes to this talk thinking I'm going to talk about heroin, right? Have I mentioned heroin? Mm -mm, I haven't, right? But I am going to talk about opiates now. And you guys are almost done because I know everybody's got to go home. But every day I get up in the morning and I make my coffee and I walk the dog and I read the obituaries. That's my, I do it all together a lot of the time. And people are always like, man, you must be a low dopamine negative person that you're obsessed with the obituaries. But I'm not. I'm a golden retriever, and I feel great most of the time. But I read the obituaries because I'm a family doctor that takes care of people who are sick. And I have you know, 12 people on hospice right now. I need to know who died last night. That's the way I work. I need to call the families. I need to fill out the death certificate. I need to know who died last night. And so in December of 2012, I read the obituary of that young woman in the top left wearing the red city year jacket. And it read, Ashley Sims, age 21, died at home of a heroin overdose. And I thought to myself, oh my God, Ashley died. And then I thought, I need to call her grandmothers who raised her. And I called them um, to tell them how sick I was about Ashley's death. But then I said, I am so grateful you told the truth about how Ashley died. Because it was 2012, and I had been reading obituaries of young people dying unexpectedly at home for several years. And I live in the middle of nowhere where I know everybody, and I often knew how people died. But I'm telling you, if it's an unexpected death at home, it's either an overdose or a suicide. Unless the bottom says, please give money to the Dana-Farber Society or the Lymphoma Leukemia Society, young people dying unexpectedly in today's age is somebody who's killed themselves one way or another. So those brave grandmothers went to our little tiny Greenfield recorder and said, you need to start telling the story about what opiates have done to our community. And our little tiny Greenfield recorder began running front page stories every day for weeks and months on end, talking about the devastation of heroin in our town. But the truth is, Greenfield's not any worse than anywhere else. I travel all over the place now, and lots of times I'm like, God, Greenfield's looking good in comparison. Um, but this little newspaper began to blow up the story five or six years ago. And then the truth is more and more of us have gotten involved in, in this epidemic and how to help pe get people better. There's no doubt in my mind that pills are on the hook for the epidemic. I don't ever argue that. For our 20 years of over-prescribing prescription opiates created this epidemic. Is it what's killing people today? No, I don't think it is. Heroin and fentanyl, carfentanil, that's what kills you. But this is the way most people started. Today's day, I got 14-year-olds whose first drug out of the, out of the uh, gate is heroin, right? They've never known anything about the pills. But in the original move, this was the way it started. And when you look at how we prescribe pills in this country compared to every other country in the world, and the United States is out of control with our opiate prescribing. You think Greece doesn't have pain? Of course they have pain. Do you think they don't have operations? Of course they have operations. But their prescribing practices is very different. When you look at how it is we die for um, unexpected deaths uh, in this country, you know, now opiate overdose or overdose, de overdose deaths has superseded motor vehicle accidents, gun violence, um, AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic. We have now surpassed all of that. The number one cause of death under the age of 50 is death by overdose. That's where we are today. We are losing 91, maybe even more than that, Americans every single day to opiates, every single day. So this is what the nation looked like. That top map is 2003, and you start marching yourself along. Those red areas are overdose deaths. It ends in 2014, before we see a lot of fentanyl and carfentanil arriving. So that map is a lot more red now. 
I, um, I trained in, in New England, and I, as you guys know, I trained in Boston. And the truth is, Massachusetts was never a very heavy prescribing opiate state. When you looked at the statistics back in the 2000s, we were ranking like 41, 44 in the country in terms of prescribing opiates. But during my training, we used to call I-95 Oxy Highway, because we knew that's where the opiates were coming from. They were coming up from Florida. So there was this huge industry, 600 or more pain pills, pill mills in the state of Florida, and you would send a tour bus down from Kentucky or Western Mass or Maine, and you would get all your nights paid for at a hotel and all your meals paid for, and all you needed to do is walk into a couple of these pill mills a day. You had a stack of cash that they gave you. You didn't need to limp. You needed no medical record. You probably didn't even need a diagnosis. You hand over your stack of cash. You walk out with bottles of pills and a stack of prescription, which you then hand off your tour operator, and then they bring it back to the streets and towns of Maine and Kentucky and Massachusetts. And so when the FDA finally said to the state of Florida and the federal government, we will cut off all federal funding until you, fine state of Florida, can get yourself under control because you are destroying the entire eastern seaboard. In 2009 and 2010, nearly every one of those pill mills were shut down. 34 doctors with American licenses and American training went to jail. They weren't doctors, they were drug dealers. Um, and when all of those pill mills got shut down, it was probably a good thing, except it wasn't so good for the hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of Americans struggling with addiction to opiates. Because what were they left with? Right. The unintended consequence of this good act is what we had left was this incredibly cheap, incredibly pure, and incredibly deadly drug that had already been widely distributed throughout the country. Mexican cartels were watching everything we were, they were doing. They knew what was coming down, and they have a very smart, very high-tech, nonviolent distribution system. Any one of us can text somebody, and we will have 50 bags of dope in the lobby in four minutes. Done, right? The stuff comes in here, it involves Uber and Lyft and FedEx and UPS and lots of airplanes. And no giant wall is going to shut this down. It's not happening. So when you ask EMS what their number one drug of concern is in the country, those dark green areas, the answer is heroin. And then you look at this map and you're like, what the heck's up with the southeast? Why don't they have a heroin problem like we have a heroin problem? And the answer is those dark purple states are states where there's a heavy prescribing pattern. Those dark purple states, on average, have between 1 and 1.5 bottles of opiates per person. So these are states in today's age where people are still prescribing a huge amount of prescriptions. When you look at the country in terms of heroin use, those red and orange states, the answer is that's our number one drug problem is heroin. And if you can imagine, the Food and Drug Administration and the CDC and CVS, which as of a month ago said they will no longer fill prescriptions for opiates for more than seven days. CVS owns the market for 26% of the country. So when a pharmacy like CVS says, we're not going to fill your script, all of a sudden the patterns of prescribing in those purple states start to change. And those purple states will turn into red states. And if you think that Arkansas and Alabama and Mississippi are building methadone clinics right now and training all their medical school graduates in how to prescribe buprenorphine and having forums like this at night and putting Narcan in every patrol car, that's not happening in those states. These are states that don't put value on public health expenditure, right? I'm not trying to be anti-Southern. I know I'm from Massachusetts and specifically from Worcester County. But I am telling you that the rates of overdose death in the next three to five years in the Southeast will blow our minds. And I'm miserable about that. I think we're going to lose 500,000 people in the Southeast in the next three to five years to heroin. It's devastating, right? We are in the middle of this, and for, as everybody knows, as of this week, it looks as though the last nine months of opiate overdose deaths in Massachusetts have actually flattened and possibly come down, which is a huge celebration. I think that's great. Um, but I'm telling you, nationwide, we are not ahead of this curve. We are in the very beginning of this tsunami. I'm going to say something about the reduction in opiate deaths. I actually. Um, I believe the data. I don't doubt 
the government data, I believe it. But really what I think is we're saving people's lives more. Every one of our uniformed officers out there has Narcan on them. I have Narcan in my bag, I have Narcan in my car. I just think we're saving more lives. And the problem is it's really hard to dig in the data to look at the number of saves. When I have learned to cope training people left and right in how to use naloxone and save people's lives, we're saving people. That's a great thing. It doesn't mean more people aren't overdosing those, right? They're overdosing like mad. It's just that we're bringing them back to life and hopefully getting them into treatment. So I don't know if we're ahead of the curve, right? That's the question. And so we can't get our foot, we should not take our foot off the accelerator on this. Okay, so how do our kids get opiates? In general, I am gonna make the statement that in general, our kids are not abusing opiates. This is statistically the case. Something like 2% or less of our kids are struggling with any opiates. That's a great thing. Why is that? Because my hope is that every medicine cabinet in this room does not have a controlled substance in it. And if you have a controlled substance at your house, whether it's a stimulant like Adderall or Ritalin or benzodiazepam like Xanax or Ativan or Clonopin or an opiate like Vicodin or Oxycontin, on anything that you have that you think you're saving for a rainy day when you blow your back out again, you, that stuff belongs in the police take back box. The fact that I'm even having these words coming out of my mouth at this stage, I'm done with this conversation. That's a conversation that should have happened four years ago. This stuff does not belong in your house. If you have an active struggle with chronic pain and you use opiates, it belongs under lock and key, period. Otherwise, get it out of your house. Bring it to the Shrewsbury Police Station. They'll incinerate it for you but get it out of your house. This is the reason our kids are not struggling. They don't have access to the pills anymore. That's really good, that is positive. Where do our kids get them? They get them from prescriptions when they're injured, when they get their appendix out, when they break their femur playing ice hockey. They also get it from oral surgery. We all know that. That's always one of our big fears, the 19 to 21 year olds who get their wisdom teeth out. So can anybody in the room tell me about a recent prescription you may have gotten at the dentist or the oral surgeon? Yes. How much was it, may I ask you? Don't know? So here's somebody who had a family member who had oral surgery. They went to CVS. The pharmacist had big wide eyes and said, holy smokes. And that family chose not to fill the script, right? That is parents and, a, and those of us in the community taking charge. Anybody else get a script written that they can remember the number of? Yeah. Something, Percocet, Oxycodone? This year, you were, you received, okay, four years ago. Exactly. Right, okay. So four years ago, the answer was always I got 30. Every now and then I would hear I got 60, right? That was four years ago answer, always. I have to say today, the numbers are lower. I'm hearing more like 12 or 15. What'd you get? Yeah. She had nasal surgery, which is painful, by the way, and she was given three of something. That is positive, right? And let me be clear. If you were in terrible pain after you used your three, I hope that doctor said to you, please call me, and I will help you out, right? They're not abandoning people. I'm on call 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and so is a lot, or a lot of us in my practice. Like, call us, and we'll still help you. So there has been a major downward trend in prescribing, and that is a good thing. Part of it was Governor Baker making really good policies. Part of it is that more of us got educated about this problem. And then the other thing is that when you ask people, how much did you use after your oral surgery, the answer is 100% of the time, I use zero, two, four, or six. I have never heard of anybody using more than six. I have now officially asked like 20,000 people. They don't use more than that. So oral surgery, ask for six or less. If your mouth is killing you after you use your six, call somebody. Somebody's on call for that practice, I promise you. Okay. I am gonna say, this is a learn to cope slide, and I really think that you should pay attention to your kids in your kids' rooms. Now, I don't clean my kids' rooms, I don't do their laundry, I do nothing in their rooms except get high blood pressure every time I walk in there and I do a lot of yelling. But I do go through their rooms to look for things that are concerning to me. I look for those bottles of like ibuprofen or Benadryl that they know they're never supposed to take without talking to me. I look for worrisome signs of somebody who may be struggling with addiction or major mental health stuff. I know what marijuana paraphernalia looks like. I look for that. 
If I found a straw in my kid's room, I actually, I know I look like I'm a crazy parent. First of all, straws are very unenvironmental, and my kids know I hate them for environmental reasons, but I don't want to see a straw in my kid's room. They're not supposed to be eating and drinking in their room at my house. I live in the country. We have mice everywhere. But the other thing, for me, a straw is something you're snorting drugs through, right? That's me being slightly crazy, paranoid parent. I know that. Um, anything that you could cut drugs with, a, a, a straight edge razor, first of all, no kid has a straight edge razor in their room for a good reason. They're either causing self-harm or they're cutting drugs, right? They're definitely not glazing anybody's windows. So <laughs> looking in your kid's room for something that they could cut with, whether it's a straight edge razor or another kind of knife, um, finding bleach or vinegar in your kid's room, I promise they're not cleaning them. I know that they're not using any cleaning products in my kid's room, but when you talk to parents whose kids have struggled, they're like, we were going through bottles and bottles of bleach and vinegar, stuff you would clean works with, and you, you had no idea why. Kids would be asking their parents all the time for bags of cotton balls or Q-tips. It helps act as a filter. I don't know the last time you guys bought a box of Q-tips. It takes my family like 10 years to go through a box of Q-tips. So these are some of the warning signs you might want to look for. And when parents bring me their kid, in, and then in all this hindsight, they reflect upon this, I think to myself, and they think to themselves, man, I wish I had known. So Learn to Cope had or has a table out there. They are an amazing support group for family members and parents who have family members struggling with addiction. Um, and Learn to Cope was started by a Massachusetts mom very locally, and it's an amazing, very critical organization in our community. Okay, so if you love somebody who has an addiction to an opiate, you need to have Narcan on you. And if you are the first responder, like my nurses up front, if somebody goes down right now, you think they're not going to look at the school nurses? Does Shrewsbury High School have Narcan in the school nurse's office? Thank God for that, right? But four years ago, no school nurses in Massachusetts had this. And you know who changed that? The school nurses changed that, right? There was some talk we were giving, and I was like, who has Narcan at the school? And it was only my little school nurse who had her hand up. And I was like, guess what, my friends? They're all women. And I think every school nurse is a woman. Maybe there's some guys out there. You're going to change that this week. Here's some written orders for Narcan at your school. Don't ask anybody. I believe and apologize later, right? <laughs> I never ask anybody anything. And some people went through their school boards. But you know what? The likelihood of there being an overdose in this school, it's a huge school. It's not 0%, right? It's some percent. And it may not be a kid. It could be a staff member. It could be a community member. Having Narcan in the school nurse's office seems like a really smart idea. And the school nurses can get this drug for free. It doesn't cost the district anything. So if you have somebody you love that you're worried about, you should have Narcan on you. And you can walk into any Walgreens or CVS. And as of a little while ago, very soon, any pharmacy in Massachusetts is mandated to carry Narcan without a prescription that anybody can walk in and get it. It runs under your insurance. And they don't actually have the right to ask you, why do you need this? It's none of their business, right? You need it because you're a human being. There's good Samaritan laws in this state. If you use it, Narcan, the drug overdose reversal drug on somebody who's having a seizure, are you going to hurt them? Nope. Will you have helped them? Probably not. You need to call 911 first. 911 first, and then you use naloxone. And you won't harm somebody who isn't really overdosing. Um, People get better with addiction. I know I just like deluged you guys with a lot of information, but I'm going to tell you, I have been doing this work for 18 years. I have never done this work as deeply as I'm doing it now. But I take care of people who get better all the time. I also take care of people who are really struggling day to day. It doesn't take one thing to get better. It's not about going to 90 meetings in 90 days. It's not just about the drug. It takes a lot of different pieces of the pie to make you better. Everybody on their wheelhouse of what it takes to get better needs to have long-term sober living, period. And if you're going to go right back to the house where your, dad or your husband is drinking nonstop and you're desperately trying not to drink, you will not succeed. You have got to find a place where people are not actively using drugs or using alcohol. And this is the biggest absence we have in the state of Massachusetts, is long-term structured sober living. So when Governor Baker came out yesterday saying, we're going to have more money, this is all good, we're going to give more money to detox beds, my skin crawled a little bit. Because the truth is, we have plenty of, of treatment beds. They're full a lot of the time. We don't need lots more of those. 
We need a place for people to long-term live sober lives at six months and nine months and a year and a half. It is a very, very hard thing to find in our communities for those of us who try to help people. What else does it take to get better? I'm a big believer in medically assisted treatment, using medicine to help people get rid of their addiction. I do it for nicotine, I do it for alcohol, and I do it for opiates all day long. I do not do it for cocaine because there's no drug that works at this point for cocaine. But otherwise, I believe in methadone, I believe in buprenorphine, I use some um, naltrexone. These drugs save lives. We have tons of data on it. Um, and I feel very strongly that people have got to be open-minded about what it takes to get better less rigid thinking. People need to have a sense of purpose. They need to have a job. They need to go back to school. They need to take care of animals and raise their kids. Going to jail for your addiction does not rebuild the dopamine in your brain. What rebuilds the dopamine is that stuff I just listed. Exercise, falling in love, being outside, growing things, giving back to society. That's what makes your brain better. And brains get better. It takes about 18 to 24, maybe a little bit longer months. It takes a long time. But locking somebody up into a little cement jail somewhere in a county jail somewhere where they're getting not much treatment doesn't make you better. And you know who those people are in jail? They're your nephews and your neighbors, my friends. You think these are like all criminals? They're young kids who have addiction and they made some bad decisions. They all have high A scores, I'll tell you that. Okay, these are books on addiction that I've read in the last eight years that I thought were great. There's people in the room who've read these books. Who's read any of these books? What have you guys read? Dreamland. Which one? Dreamland. Okay, so Dreamland is about the distribution of the drug in this country and how smart it is, and it's a good book. It's distressing. Who else has read a book that they liked? Clean. Clean. You read Clean. I never hear that one. I'm so glad you read that. That's a Great book. So David Sheff is the author of Beautiful Boy, and he wrote Clean. Clean is about sort of failed drug policy and how we could really be doing things better. Beautiful Boy, I know there's people in the room who read that. It's about his experience raising his son who struggled with terrible addiction. He's a beautiful writer. And as a parent, oh, I cried throughout that book. And, and I'm in deep, and I still was so upset with that book. So these are all great books. If the stuff on trauma in ACE scores resonated with you, that top middle book is called The Body Keeps the Score, and it's the best book on trauma and what high A scores do to the human body. And if you're anywhere working with human beings during the day, I really think you need to know more about this. This book changed my life. It changed how I am as a doctor. It's been one of the most impactful things I've ever read. I have a website. One of my kids built me a website, which was really sweet of him. Um, it has my videos on it. It has some of my speaking stuff on it. It has articles that I thought are interesting. Um, so if you thought to yourself, I want to go give this talk to Kiwanis, but I need to watch it one more time, the talks are always different. I update things a bit. Every three months, I go through things and make them more accurate or up to date. But I have videos there that are filmed at high schools like this. I actually give talks to judges and correctional officers. Yesterday, I was giving talks to district attorneys. Um, I, I'd like to try to influence change. I like to try to influence people's thinking so that we can really get ahead of this, this problem. So, but again, these are the books that I think are the best. You could take smartphone pictures. I am happy to take questions. Do people have questions? Yes. Yep. So the question was, what is an alternative drug for a child who's had surgery? And that codeine, specifically, back in the day, Tylenol 3, we used it all the time, it's really considered not safe for kids. It gets um, metabolized very differently for different kinds of kids. So in general, pediatricians and family doctors stay the heck away from codeine for kids. And so it's hard. So first of all, one of the things I would do as a parent is to look at your provider in the eye and say, I want to reduce the risk for my kid for being exposed to opiates. Give me a strategy to limit the opiates as much as possible. So let's talk about that. That's would be a question going out of the gate. Um, the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen together, Tylenol and Motrin together, actually in combination, not divided every four hours, works as well as a five milligram oxycodone. But as a parent, you've got to be paying attention because it gets really confusing, the bubble gum and the orange flavor and what's in what's bottle. It's the middle of the night and you're a mess, right? So you've got to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, 
doing nerve blocks. It, you know, it depends on the procedure, but we're trying to get better and better at helping treat people's pain without just relying on the opiates. So doing a nerve block that's a long-acting nerve block somewhere in the body could help that person. Topical agents, and again, it depends on how big and bad the surgery is, but I use topical compounded creams now all the time for my pain patients. I have a company that compounds for them, and you know what's in them? Horrifying drugs, but guess what they are? They're in a cream, right? You can't eat it because it tastes horrible, and you rub it on your body, and it soaks in. And I had knee surgery two weeks ago, um, and my surgeon was local. I'm not putting him under the bus exactly, but he just moved here from Georgia, and he gave me 50 Percocet, 50. And I thought to him, for myself, I thought, this guy doesn't know who I am. He is going to know exactly who I am next week on my follow-up appointment. Um, and, and I used zero of them. And what did I do instead? I actually I applied a topical cream that had made a huge difference for me that has ketamine and gabapentin and, and uh, nortriptyline. It has seven different ingredients in it. Most of your average primary care doctor doesn't know about this stuff, but it totally exists. You just have to ask. Um, so my point is, is ask the question and see what they can come up with. You know, IV Tylenol in the hospital actually is much more potent than just the pill form. So more and more people taking care of kids are aware of this, but not enough are aware enough is what I'll say. Yes? So, so the Narcan, you talked about getting that full vitamin sugar, and I think it's a great idea to save the life. I've wondered personally, when is that become a safety net for the addict? So the addict says, I took X amount last week, I'll take a little more, get a little higher. If I OD, everyone that shows up to my overdose is going to have Narcan. Yeah. So I take care of people with addiction all day. All day long is what I do. And most people don't think that way. They just don't. That is actually too much pre-planning and thought to go into it, quite honestly. And most people have no idea what they're really getting. They're going to buy a certain dollar amount of something, and they're going to use the same or different dealer, and they're going to hope it's the same or better than last time. But the truth is, they know it's a Russian roulette every time that they use. So I think a totally rational brain might think that way. And instead, what I find is that people use what they're going to use to feel better, maybe to feel high some days, and they use what they could afford that day. And when they overdose, most people People feel horrified and terrified, and that's when they come knocking down the door for a treatment center. Every day I have people who race in to my treatment center, because I, I happen to run a treatment center, and they say, I OD'd last night, and I can't do this anymore. My mother is brokenhearted. My kids are brokenhearted. I can't do this anymore. Do they likely relapse sometime in the future? Sure, it's possible. So I don't spend time trying to get into people's brains and trying to think, am I creating worse addiction by not saving lives? I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. Um, people get better, but sometimes it takes a lot of tries. And for, you know, I have a guy I take care of who's been in detox 104 times. That's a lot of admissions, right? You know who he is now? He's been sober for 10 years. He's running meetings. He's all good. But that 104 admissions, that's a guy you really wanted to dope slap because that's really frustrating. And then you take a breath and you remind yourself, compulsivity and perseveration. So I hear what you're saying. Uh, but I wouldn't deny an EpiPen to somebody who can't stop eating their shellfish or accidentally keeps getting exposed. Like, there's so many things I would not deny somebody who's struggling with addiction. You know what I do with my diabetics who are totally out of control and are eating like a hostess cupcake in front of me? I get them more help, right? I don't get them less. I don't fire them even though they're ruining my statistics. I don't take away their meds and kick them to the curb. I have my diabetes educators and endocrinologists call them and I bring them in more. We don't do that with people with addiction. We just get mad and boot them. So philosophically, as somebody who takes care of all the chronic diseases, for me, this is just another chronic disease, and I'm trying to keep people alive. How do you feel about AA? What would you say? Was that the full question? How do I feel about what? How do you feel about AA? Oh, AA. I didn't hear. I, didn't, I missed the last two letters. How do I feel about AA? I think peer-to-peer -peer recovery works really well for a lot of people. One of my worries is that for people in peer-to-peer -peer recovery, there's sometimes an attitude of it's my way or the highway, and this is the way I got sober. I went to 90 meetings in 90 days, and I'm working the 12 steps really well, and that's how you have to get sober, too. For me, having rigid thinking is not helping anybody. I am very flexible in my thinking, and for people who get tremendous benefit from working the 12 steps and going to NAAA, any of the meetings out there, I think that's wonderful for them. But I don't mandate it for my patients. I don't lock them in and say, you're a failure if you're not going to meetings. It doesn't work for 
for them. For some of them, young people, I got 17 year olds, I don't want them at most of my AA meetings. Like there, that is not a positive environment for them. So if it works for you, I am 100% supportive. I know every AA meeting in my county, but it doesn't work for everybody. There is a lot of money to be made in addiction these days, a lot of money. Anybody want to make some money? Go into some addiction treatment plan because I tell you, you're going to make some money and a lot of it is terrible. And I hate these places in Florida. There is no proof to me that they're practicing evidence-based care. There are towns in Florida that are just block upon block of sober living where actually everybody's just getting high. These treatment centers basically throw you into a van and bring you to an AA meeting down the street. That's not treatment. Like seriously, people are spending $30,000 a month for that. It's appalling. <coughs> And, and it's, a, it's a racket, and they're taking advantage of people who are desperate and alone and will do anything to help their people get better. So I actually hate that kind of thing. I actually think we have some really good long-term, for 40 years, have been doing the work treatment in Massachusetts. There have, uh, the arrival of the for-profits has happened. There's one, I drove by it on the way here. Some of the for-profits do pretty good work, but man, they're expensive. I mean, literally $30,000 a month. And until recently, most of them don't take mass health. I only ta I take care of mass health patients. I take care of gangbangers. Like, that's my job. Um, so I think that there's a wide variety of treatment. If you have somebody you love who you're worried about, don't go on the internet to find a place, please, because you will get sold a bill of goods, because these guys are after your pocketbook. So I do think there's some very good, well-established places, and there are people who know this. You think Learn to Cope doesn't know? The parents there, they know. They've gone through the ringer 20 times. They know the places that are good quality. But yeah, these places, it, a lot of this stuff is really taking advantage of people who are struggling. It's, a, it's the, it's the, it's the we, we could have predicted this was going to happen. I wouldn't let them into my hospital is what I will say. I won't interact with them. I hate them sometimes. Yes, and do you know what? Representative Kane is saying, I'm going to stay after to answer questions because we probably need to empty out the auditorium. I have to tell you that 81% of the people who overdosed and died in Massachusetts last year of an opioid, it was laced with fentanyl. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more powerful than heroin is. Fentanyl is now being laced in with marijuana. It's being laced into any other drug. So you cannot look at a joint or marijuana and, and tell whether or not that is marijuana on its own or marijuana that's laced with fentanyl. So don't make the assumption or the mistake that some people make that one is better than the other. We need to make sure our kids don't use it all. And that's another really important message that you need to share with your friends because when you look into the statistics, as we're 10% down right now in the number of deaths um, for people overdosing and dying, but 81% of those people who died, it was they had fentanyl in it. And you can't Narcan someone back to life with that if they are overdosing from fentanyl. It's going to take five to 10 times of giving them an overdose of Narcan before 
um, you even have a chance of saving them and you don't have the time to do it. So um, I also want to acknowledge that Senator Mike Moore is here tonight and he is a great partner with me on Beacon Hill and has spent a lot of time working on these issues as well. So thank you, Senator, for being here. And also our superintendent of schools, many school committee members and selectmen, not just from Shrewsbury here in the audience, but Westboro and Holden is here as well. So thank you. And um, as we said, SCAPE, which is the Shrewsbury Coalition for Addiction Prevention Education, uh, we are a small but mighty group, and if the people who are part of SCAPE could just stand for a minute and turn around. Noelle Freeman, Jessica Rice, all the ladies, they are. Um, and I would encourage you, we have a Facebook page, and I would really encourage you to go like that Facebook page, and we will um, have information there. This um, is going to play on Shrewsbury Media. We will let you know when it's going to play so that you can, again, send the link to other friends. Um, and let them know. We lost six people last year who died in Shrewsbury overdosing to opioids. This is, uh, we're not over the hurdle yet, and I think as Dr. Pody said, it's gonna get worse before it gets better, not just in the southeast, but in uh, where we live as well. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Todd uh, Bazil, for hosting us here at the high school, uh, and please help us continue to spread this message so that we can make sure our youth do not experience what so many youth are in the midst of experiencing right now. Thank you. Thank you.